Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Opportunities and Challenges for Applying Machine Learning in the Cannabis Space. It is presented by James Eves, PhD, a professor in the Department of Management at Laval University. My name is Judy O'Rourke and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eves. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Hi, Judy. Thanks a lot for that introduction. Um, as Judy said, I'm a professor at Laval University, um, and I, I'm also an agricultural economist. My specialty is finding ways to integrate technology and methods into controlled environmental agricultural um, facilities to increase the improve the profitability and efficiency of growing cannabis. I'm also the head of innovation at um, Green Seal Cannabis Company, which is a licensed producer of cannabis in Stratford, Ontario. They use an advanced um, vertical um, growing method um, to grow cannabis and are highly R&D focused. Um, so as their head of innovation, I manage all the R&D programs um, and we have a wide range of uh, programs that we do internally and in partnership with universities. Um, we have genetics programs, uh, projects related to automation, horticulture, of course. And recently we started a really interesting one um, related to machine learning in partnership with uh, three universities um, across uh, North America. Um, and that's what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today is just to give you some insights into the opportunities and challenges um, facing people who would like to apply machine learning um, to the agricultural space. Um, just to give you some context, um, like uh, sophisticated or advanced um, greenhouse or indoor growing facilities manage their environmental conditions and plant inputs using um, management systems. Um, in other words, that these systems control, precisely control um, environmental con conditions and things like how much water uh, and how much water a plant receives and when, um, the nutrients, uh, the CO2 levels, and of course, to do all those things, um, they have to continuously monitor all those factors and environmental conditions using sensors. So it's, these, it's the data gathered by these sensors over a period of time that create the opportunity to use those data um, to train machines either to replace human tasks um, by training these machines, by looking at examples of humans doing these tasks, or to train the machines to actually learn new things that we weren't aware of, new ways to improve um, efficiency or profitability. And what's really interesting is that over time, these machines can, can, can learn, as they, get, as they gather more data, can, can learn more ways or to learn to improve um, th those processes um, without human input. And that's why we refer to this as um, machine learning. So what I want to do today is just go quickly, um, go through the machine learning process to give you insights into how, in general, how you build a machine learning um, method or machine learning model. Then talk about some agricultural applications, non-cannabis agricultural applications of machine learning. I'm not aware of any applications of machine learning um, that have been published 
to um, related to improving the efficiency or profitability of growing cannabis. I am aware of some that are you that they some studies that have proposed using machine learning to identify um, cannabis um, in or in order for enforcement of laws. Um, but I ha I'm not aware of any um, any research that's that's specifically designed to improve the profitability of growing cannabis. Um, so what I'd like to do is just use these examples to give you some sense about um, how it's applied to our culture, and those examples will be relevant to cannabis, as you'll see. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about some potential opportunities of applying machine learning to cannabis using examples from the facility that I work at. Um, the, the mental model that I like to use when I think about what machine learning is, is just, it's a, it's a way, it's a machine learning algorithms are just question answering machines. And of course I can build a machine to do, I, I can build, I can use lots of different machines to, to do the same task. Um, the difference will be the level of effectiveness a machine, each machine performs that task. And so, of course, your goal is to find the machine that works the best. And in machine learning, those, those machines, those, those question answer machines are referred to as models. Um, and in order to take you through the process or to give you some intuition about the process of building those models, I'd like to use a simple, um, typical example of a video streaming service that wants to make good recommendations to movie recommendations to its customers so that they want to build a model that's capable of answering the question, will this particular question, customer like this movie or not? Um, and so what, 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 what the movie, the streaming company will do is, is show that, that model or this machine um, data in order to build um, that, in order to, to, to create that question answering machine and refine it over time using this iterative process we call training. And you'll see that this is exactly, this training process is, is very intuitive. Like the process itself is very intuitive. Um, like for once, if you think about trying to teach, uh, like for instance, your child the, uh, to distinguish between ripe peach and non-ripe peach, peaches that are, are ready to eat and peaches that aren't ready to eat, um, you would go through this process. You would first find peaches that were both ripe and not ripe, um, and then choose characteristics of those peaches that you think are correlated with ripeness. For instance, you might, the color, the smell, the texture, how firm they are, right? And you would teach the child to recognize those characteristics um, in order to be to distinguish between the two classes of peach. And at the end, you would show the child peaches that they've never seen before and ask them to tell you whether they're ripe or not. And that's how you would evaluate the training process, right? It, training a machine is, is what goes through exactly the same process. Um, for instance, the first part of that process is gathering data, right? So if we stick with our, our our uh, video streaming example, some of that data might include the genre of the movie, the country of origin, how long the movie is, the particular actors, um, how much it costs to develop it. Is it a high budget movie or a low budget movie? Right. Um, we refer to these characteristics as features. These are the, the, the characteristics of the movie are features. Um, then, you know, there's a large number of features that you could consider using, um, and you want to use the best ones. And so that process of picking the ones that you think are most highly correlated with this target, this, this thing you want to accomplish, a question you want to answer, is called feature selection. Um, and then finally, we want to tag those characteristics or label those characteristics with whether or not um, the customer liked or disliked um, the, the, phone, the, the, um, the movie. So at the end, your data set might look like something, look something like this. Like, so imagine that we picked 100 movies, um, 
And we just decided that two features were important, the number of action films and the, and the budget for this particular person. And then each of those, each set of features, we labeled whether or not our customer liked that movie. This is obviously data they would get from their, their web interface. Then the next phase is splitting the data into a training and evaluation data set. The training data set will use to actually teach the computer um, to make answer that question well, given those features. And at the end, after it's been sufficiently trained, we'll go and show the data, the computer um, new data, right? We, which and the data that it, the machine hasn't seen before to test how well it answers questions, how well it's been trained. And that the data we draw from is, comes from the evaluation data set. And typically, um, researchers will split these, will use about 80% of the data of their data set for training and the remaining 20 for evaluation. But there's a whole, there's a, the whole literature um, based on the, like the different ways of splitting a data set between training and evaluation. So in the next, in the next step, you'll select a model. Um, and the first thing here, I, I plotted our fictional data in this, in this figure. Um, on the vertical axis, I have the movie budget. And on the, the horizontal axis, I have the number of action scenes. And I've colored uh, data points red if the person didn't like the movie and green if they did. And so what I need now is some sort of model um, to determine whether, what, whether or not, when I show a new movie, whether or not um, the person's going to like that based on this training data set. Um, you might look at this data set and say, oh, well, this is obvious. I don't, I don't need a model. Um, this person obviously likes low-budget action films. Right? But then if I showed you a new data point and asked you to classify it, um, it might be, you know, it, it might be more challenging than you think. You'll need some sort of rule or some sort of mechanism for determining whether or not that's um, for guessing whether or not the the, the client liked this movie or not. One intuitive method might be just to draw a circle around uh, around the new movie and decide well if there's if that if that circle captures more movies that the person liked than they disliked, I'll just classify that um, new movie as a movie that the, the person liked, right? And this is actually, um, this is actually um, uh, basically a common and popular machine learning model called um, k Nears Neighbors, right? But like, as I said, there's lots of different models that we could use, like another one is a support vector machines where you actually try to estimate a boundary between the two groups. Um, and depending on which, the, what distinguishes these models is just their, I mean, their, is their relative performance. And the performance of those models is going to vary depending on the application. For instance, in this, in this study, which I've cited back here, um, the researchers um, review, review, reviewed a large number of um, machine learning vision models that had been applied to agriculture applications. Uh, and, they, and they used that data to try to determine which models performed um, relatively better on which type of agricultural applications. Um, so I, this is a study that I, I find, if, it, if you're, if it, I find it's relevant um, to uh, the cannabis industry also, because as I said, these applications are obviously going to be very similar. Um, so the next step will be going through this iterative, iterative process to actually train the model to actually do, to, to get it in a place where it'll answer that question um, as, uh, as well as possible. And what I mean by training is actually working, choosing your models, and then, then adjusting the parameters of those models um, to a point where they answer where they perform the best. For instance, staying with our current um, example, 
um, you might change the shape or of that circle or the number of movies that circle captures, right? And you would change those parameters until you optimize the performance of that model in the training data set. And when you're at the point where you're satisfied with the, the performance of your model, um, that's when you would take the evaluation data set and start showing the machine um, data points it's never seen before and asking it to answer that question and then recording whether how often it answered it qu correctly, right? Um, so you do that and, and then measure that. Some, there are different measures of accuracy. Um, and then you would, if you're satisfied with that measure of accuracy, then you could implement the model. And if you're not, you might return to the training process. Okay. Um, I went through that quickly, um, but, but I, what the point is of that, I think it's important to understand that process um, because when we go and start talking about the context of can applying these to cannabis, you'll see that certain institutional fat features of the cannabis industry um, make it particularly challenging to apply um, that process to cannabis. All right, so now I would like to, I'm gonna go look at a couple quick examples of applications of machine learning in the agricultural sector that are relevant to cannabis. Um, so in this first study, um, the researchers use a spectral sensing um, um, method to, to identify, to use leaves, identify if a citrus plant was suffering from citrus greening, uh, greening or uh, which is called Wang Wang Bing or HLB disease, which is a, um, which is a pathogen that's de absolutely devastating the citrus industry in Florida. Um, and what spectral sensing is, is it's based on the fact that everything has its own unique sort of spectral signature. So if I shine UV light on something, um, based on the, the chemical makeup of that substance, um, the, the thing is going to emit um, wavelengths back or out from like the plant or leaf will emit wavelengths out um, in a pattern that depends on the chemicals in the plants. Um, for instance, if you shine UV light on leaves, right, based on the, the amount of chlorophyll the leaf is producing, um, the amount of sugars in the leaf, the oxygen concentration, terp terpene profile, um, all those things will affect the particular signature that's emitted from the plant. So what these researchers did is they trained by, by having healthy um, leaves or leaves selected from healthy plants and leaves selected from plants that had HLB, they, they identified a particular spectral signature from HLB contaminated plants um, and trained their machine to distinguish um, those leaves from healthy leaves. And if you look at the picture on the right, you can see why this would add value because if an HLB infected plant, um, the leaves look quite similar to a plant that has a nutrient or magnesium um, deficiency. So we can imagine that might be difficult for or challenging for um, like production workers to actually make that, distinct, that, that distinction. And of course, you might want to identify lots of different pathogens, right? You might just want to have this more general tool that could tell you if your plant is healthy or if it's not, and if it's not, what's the particular problem? Um, and that's what, so these, in this next study, um, these researchers went and used this transformation process to, to take the signals that the plants the plants were emitting when they were when when UV light was shining on them. This, they took the, that spectral signature um, and decomposed it so that they could try to identify, um, use that to build a machine that could identify multiple different um, pathogens. 
including an aphid um, infestation and powdery mildew, which are two very common threats to uh, cannabis producers. Okay. Um, another valuable um, piece of information for producers, for farmers, is the amount of yields they can expect to have and at a given point in time and the distribution of those yields across their farm. Um, th that information allows the producer to plan labor and things like packaging, but it also, by looking at the distribution, the mapping of the yields across the field, um, it also allows them to get insights into what's right and what's wrong with their production techniques. In, uh, in other words, like if I notice that on one part of my farm, um, that yields are much higher than another part, there might be some, there's some spatial component to that, like for the way I'm irrigating or my, my climate control in that part of the farm, um, that would allow me to improve um, yields across all the farm, right? It allows me to identify problems and opportunities um, by looking at the spatial distribution of yields. So in this study, um, researchers took photos of, used a digital camera and took photos of plants, right, of, of in their peach, in a peach grove, and trained um, the system, the machine, to distinguish between ripe and, and, and non-ripe peaches, and also to count the ripe ones so that the farmer, that could give the farmer an estimate of what the yields will be at a given point in time, right? And the, what was interesting, not, it's not interesting, but it's important about this, is that they're using um, a kind of a more standard camera, something that, you know, a, a grower might, it, it makes the application more feasible, cheaper, more accessible to a grower so they can just carry a camera around their, and around their field. Um, So, like I said, there's no, those, those studies are relevant to cannabis. Obviously, you can imagine how those studies are relevant to cannabis. There's, not, there's none that, there's no studies that I'm aware of um, that are published um, for cannabis at this point, though I know they're happening. Like I said, I know, I know companies that are working on these algorithms right now for cannabis, um, and also we're working on them as well. Um, so what I want to do is I want to talk about some likely ones and some ones that we're working on. Okay. One of the most obvious ones is just the optimal growing recipe. Like I said, we're gathering these in these sort of advanced growing facilities. Um, we're gathering tremendous amounts of data. Um, we're, we're gathering data on continuously on CO2, on the vapor pressure differential, um, how much light plants are receiving a spectrum of that light. Um, we're constantly doing, we're using different substrates and testing dis different substrates in different parts of the process, but we're also testing different substrates. Um, fertigation, the like irrigation and, and, and nutrient applications are constantly monitored. Um, and of course the temperature. And all these things will affect the value, the combination of things will affect the value of the yield, um, but those that the, the actual relationship between those things and the, and the value of yield will depend on a cultivar also. Um, so training the machine to look at all that data over time, including yield data, um, in order to identify an optimal growing recipe for each cultivar would obviously be very valuable for a grower. Um, I wrote value of yield because the value of the yield is going to depend um, on the particular grower's business objectives. For instance, it might be yields or it might be um, the characteristics most important might be the yield. Um, it might be the terpene profile of the plant or it might be it, which, or the THC level. And currently in the market, T, the THC level, level of the plant is probably the largest driver of the value of that yield. 
this is a obvious problem and it would be like it would obviously create a lot of value for a grower to have to if there was a machine that could help us identify the optimal growing recipe but it's also a really hard problem um because you can imagine all the different combinations of 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 all these different factors um you have to gather a lot of data over a long period of time but you also the grower you need variations in all these different um variables so that the machine can learn can see the differences and learn um and so the grower is also going to have to be actively um implicated in the process and open to making adjustments um to the combinations of these variables um so that the computer can learn which combination is the most optimal um during the cannabis production process there are lots of different uh, quality control steps um for instance when we move when we decide which mothers we're going to um use to create clones you first you have to look at the health of the mother to determine whether or not that mother's healthy enough to provide healthy clones and enough healthy clones um after you move transplant the clones um from a cloner from the rock wool to um the vegetative stage right the that you don't transplant all the clones you're transplanting healthy clones right and again what's healthy is judgment made by a person at this point again then when you transplant plant clones to the flowering stage right um again there's someone that's saying okay we're going to we're we're not going we're only going to we're going to plant 80% of these um so the 20% that we don't plant that are the least healthiest again someone is a, is a is a quality judgment um and just to give you a little context if you're not familiar with the process um because we know there's lots of variability in the health of plants say baby plants that we move to um produce flower from uh we always we always produce about 20% or 30% more than we need so that we can select the healthiest of those of that batch um and this is wasteful it takes up time it takes up space it takes up um it takes up labor and so if you can find ways to reduce the necess necessity or the that percentage um that would create value for a grower one of the most the biggest bottlenecks in the production process is trimming um we eat, like even green sales a, a medium sized uh a facility but every harvest we have tens of thousands of flowers that we have to filter through um in order to determine whether they need it, whether they are they pass this quality control process um what happens if, is first you take all the flower and you drop them into because there's so many of them you don't hand trim all of them um you drop them into uh a trimming machine then they come out of the trimming machine and then someone has to decide whether or not they go back in the trimming machine which ones go back in the trimming machine um then after they go through the trimming machine they go on this these giant tables and then humans go through them and they decide whether they need hand trimming right and you see on the bottom left is an example of a plant um or a flower that needs more hand trimming because um there's still leaves sticking out of the bud and there's a stem that sticks out the bottom and so then all those have to be separated and then those goes to go to people who can perform the hand trimming until the the bud looks closer to um the photo on the bottom right which is a pass right but you can imagine this is a very like this a long process like i said it's one of the biggest bottlenecks in the production process um and because there's so many flowers you it's 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 difficult to have well trained quality control people um inspect them all so a lot of it is just is production associates who are making judgments on their own and you can imagine they're like they want to get through this process as fast as possible so there's this incentive to you know to kind of push some of these buds these flowers through the process quickly um so surely someone's going to develop a mechanism for doing that quality control using a machine learning process and image recognition process to identify these these characteristics those features um 
and and notify the grower that these um, these flowers need to be retrimmed or hand trimmed, or to just handle the process itself, just do the just direct those flowers back to the trimming process. Um, uh, then this next example is something I find really fascinating is this concept of peak ripeness. Um, it's a, at this point, it's a judgment call about when the master grower decides when to harvest. I, I mean, at some facilities, they, uh, they have a kind of strict sort of schedule for harvesting. In other words, they say, okay, every, every 70 days, we put the flowers, this, this cultivar in um, flowering, and after 70, on day 70, we harvest regardless of the, the, the ripeness of the plant. Um, but many look for visual signals, have mass, many master growers look for visual signals that they think are co correlated with what they call peak ripeness. And what peak ripeness generally is, is maximum THC levels. Again, it kind of, it matters. It depends on the actual business objective. It could be, it could be something else, but typically they're harvesting at the point where they think THC levels or, or yields are the highest. Um, and what happens is that if you get past a certain point, the maximum THC point, um, THC starts degrading into CBN, CBN um, cannabinol. And this is not, this is just another compound, cannabis compound, and it has its own effects, um, but they're not psychoactive effects. So they're, they're, so they're more sedative, they're um, often more associated with um, pain uh, uh, management uh, or what, what, what growers re refer to as couch um, lock. It's just like a sedative, heavier um, effect on the, on the user, um, which some people may like, um, but the lower THC level reduces the value of the plant since generally the market um, puts the highest value on THC. So the way growers right now determine whether a plant is ripe or not is they look at a, the stigmata in the trichomes. So if you look at the top right um, image, um, those little white leaves, those baby white leaves are sticking out of the plant um, that kind of look like hairs uh, are the stigmata. And when some percentage of those flip to from a white to a brown color or a brownish color, usually around 80, 60 to 80 percent, um, the grower will say, OK, the, the heart, this, this, this plant is ready and they harvest. Um, another typical uh, method is to look at the trichomes, right? And if you look at the bottom right hand, um, the bottom right hand photo, those little hairs that stick out from the plant are the trichomes. Um, if you look at the big plant, on the big bud on the on the left hand side, all that sort of white snowy stuff are the is that, those are trichomes, um, and so when those trichomes switch from that clear color that you to a more creamy sort of um, color, that's another visual indication that's generally believed to be correlated with maximum THC. I have no idea if that's if that's the case or not. Um, I haven't personally done that research, but that's the that's the belief. Um, so, again, surely this would be something that'd be very useful to a cannabis grower. Would be a machine to train a machine to identify visual characteristics of the plant in order to help the grower determine when um, what is peak ripeness. Um, and again, that's going to be we're going to that's the train the data from that is not only what you see in this photo, but you also have to correlate these, you also have to uh, gather data on the chemical profile of the plant. So you can correlate these visual characteristics with the chemical profile that's most desired by the grower. Um, one of the biggest mysteries to me personally is the drying and curing process, um, especially the curing process. So at the, after plants are harvested, um, they're dried. In here, we see they're, they're 
they're just hung up and dry. There's different drying methods, but in this case, they're just they hang them up and dry for some period of time, you know, a few days to over a week. Um, then after they're they're dried, um, those buds, the flowers, are placed in sealed containers um, and then cured. And what and what that curing process is, they're placed in sealed containers, um, and once a day or they're those sealed containers are opened to release the CO2 in the container um, and then closed again. And um, somehow that this curing and drying process, depending on how it's done, affects um, the flavor and the usability of the plant um, and the storability of the plant at the end. Um, I say it's a mystery to me because for the curing, I, I, I I'm personally have I really have no idea what's going on. It's something that's I've you know I've tried to I've tried to learn about it personally by looking at um, the curing literature for different plants like tobacco, um, but it's doing something, and it's surely affecting the quality of the final product. And how and how exactly it's doing that is a mystery, and it's something that um, could add a lot of value to growers by giving us more insights into what's happening. Um, for instance, there's a lot of variability in just if you look at these plants, right? These in this in this picture, you imagine like you know dozens of these racks in this giant room, everything drying, and the consistency of that room is different. Um, and so um, these plants dry depending where they are. They dry at different um, different rates, and depending at their level of maturity when they, they started this drying and, and curing process, the effectiveness of that drying and curing process is different. Um, so gathering that data and, and allowing people, allowing and, uh, training a machine uh, to correlate those factors with this target at the end of whatever it is, of just a, of a high, uh, a well, a homogeneously dried product or a product that's that can is storable for a long time or that has a, a certain flavor or high, high THC levels, um, again, would add a lot of value. So you can see at each step of this process of propagation, vegetation, flowering, drying, curing, there's all these environmental factors that impact the final result of that stage. Um, and we know very little about those the, the specific impacts of those of, of the, those combination of factors. Um, so I think this is a big area um, for uh, where machine learning can add a lot of value to um, the cannabis production process. Um, now I talked mostly about production um, applications, but there's obviously lots of applications that are um, more closely related to retail. For instance, there's forecasting um, future product demand, like what strains um, will be popular six months from now. There's tremendous amounts of data out there, either in um, the, the, the CRM systems of these companies or on the web um, that you could use to actually um, make better, help people make, these producers make better predictions about what strains are gonna be demanded six months from now and how much so they, that you can, they can use that information to um, determine their production schedules. Of course, inventory management, um, we have, you know, there's, again, we're, we're gathering all this data. We know what's coming in to our facilities. We know what we're, what we're using, um, especially because of the, this, um, the very the, the highly regulated nature of cannabis in Canada, where, where we record everything. Um, so that all that data could be used to improve um, the effectiveness of these companies in, in managing their inventories. Um, what should they set prices at? Again, how, how much should you charge for particular strains? Um, this would depend on the popularity of strain, the demand, um, trends in the market. Another very important valuable application, potential application in machine learning. We're all across North America right now they're opening stores really rapidly, retail stores. What are, this is something that machine learning um, is being used for right now in, in other sectors, um, like where McDonald's opens up its next store or, or someone that is 
it's not a ran or Starbucks is not a random decision. They're using machine learning to optimize their placement distribution of stores, right? That oh, those same methods can be used to um, help um, cannabis producers locate their stores. Um, and what products should they put in those stores? Um, every week or every month, you know, these products are changing. Um, what is the optimal like combination and curation of products in a store and on over any given period? Again, another really interesting machine learning app, potential machine learning application. Um, um, finally, I just want to talk about some challenges of applying machine learning to the cannabis state space. So if you reflect on those, those, those six steps that we go through in order to build and train a machine learning model, you'll see why it's challenge, cannabis poses um, particular challenges to machine learning entrepreneurs and researchers. Um, first, there's this really interesting thing about the cannabis industry. It's extremely secretive. Um, and that I, I believe just is a legacy effect of, you know, decades of trying to avoid prosecution is that this, there's a real culture of secrecy, right? It's not like other agriculture, it's not like tomatoes. If, you know, many of these producers are, they hide, a, they want to hide a lot of their methods. They're very apprehensive about sharing data with companies um, because they feel like they're going to reveal a secret about that makes that this d differentiates their production from our capacity from an, uh, or from another company's. Right? And so it's something you'll have to deal with. Those. It's very, it'll be very challenging to form partnerships with these companies and, and, or it's going to be more challenging to get a cannabis producer to, to form partnerships with a outside company to train these models and say a tomato grower. Um, Another thing is that even if they're open, they see the value of, of this, of these machine learning models to their business. Um, and if they want to do it, they're, they're not focused on that right now. Right now, producers are kind of trapped in this, this land grab. Um, the main sort of industry focus is getting this big, getting as many permits and as much surface area as possible. And it's very hard to convince management to devote resources to research and development at this point, even though they may talk about it right now, companies are primarily focused on just increasing their capacity, no matter what the efficiency is, they're making lots of, they're making lots of decisions are not, are not, are not necessarily efficient from a production standpoint, but it allows them to get more um, capacity online faster. Right. So another thing is just catching a producer's focus is very difficult in this market right now. Um, and finally, we talked about so we see that gathering data is going to be challenging, but also we mentioned that process, that feature selection is very important. What features, what characteristics, um, what variables are going to be the most important in answering um, the particular question you want to answer? Um, but because cannabis has been, you know, illegal and still is illegal in the United States, even I mean, or federally at least, like researchers in the United States still can't do research on cannabis, um, and researchers in Canada just started. Um, there's a extreme lack of scientific data um, to help us decide what what features will be the most important um, when we're actually specifying these machine learning models. So in all in all, this is that's why I say it's, it's cannabis is a, ch a challenging um, space right now to apply machine learning um, methods. But at the same time, it's also the the sector that has the most money and and to to spend on on this on these sort of this sort of R and D. So it's surely going to happen. I mean, it is happening. Um, so. Uh, so I encourage you to like to, I definitely encourage you to, to invest time um, to learning more about, uh, about applying these models to the space. If you have any questions, please send them to me. I'm very happy to answer whatever questions you have on this topic or related topics. And I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Eves, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Goodbye.